All right, everyone. This is the third and final installment of uh, the Curious Leadership slide deck content slides. Um, first one was 45 minutes. And then the second one, I said, oh, it should be shorter. And then it wound up being 44 minutes. So in that sense, I was I was uh, delivered to that. But this one, I think, will be way less, like seriously, way, way less. So if you recall, um, we went through a couple of models or frameworks, if you will, about appreciative inquiry and its practices and giving you opportunities to think, how might I use this organizational development model within my profession, dealing with students, children, if I'm a teacher, if I'm a rising administrator, if I am someone who works with students outside of the classroom model, like a social worker or an occupational therapist, um, anybody has the potential to be a leader within the culture that they are providing for that interaction, right? So if we go back, there were these different ones, if you recall, um, the pair framework, what's our purpose for coming together? Can we pause and appreciate, imagine, and reflect? That's the one. The other one, name it, flip it, frame it, otherwise known as Nafifi is what I call it from conversations worth having. Creating generative questions where you ask a question of curiosity as opposed to a statement of definitiveness. And then we've got the SOAR, which is the alternative to the SWOT analysis. And these questions here, which are such a great jumping off point to have those types of conversations worth having. And you might ask these questions during the AIR framework or the PAIR framework. So they all work together in tandem. Now I saved the most intricate one for last, and that is the 5D cycle. Now, if you research it, you might see in appreciative inquiry, the D cycle, that it's a 4D. I've seen it in uh, Michelle McQuaid's How to Have an Appreciative Inquiry Summit book. She has 60s, but the one that you will see most often is the 5D. And you'll see that uh, the number five has a couple of different D words with it. But here's here basically um, the 5D is the one up to the top, the definition before the 4D, it was just these four right here, but then they added a fifth one. And then I'll tell you about that sixth extra credit D in a minute. All right, so this cycle is something that you can take a person through, um, a small group through, a large group through. And that's why I was saying I love fractals so much because this is a process that can just ripple out. And as you include more and more people in the stakeholders and in this conversation, the more rich of an experience you can have you can use this in a variety of different settings. And once this becomes a framework for thinking about interacting with people through a learning cycle, through um, a design thinking cycle, it, this is how we self-organize as people who are a part of a larger collective. All right, so first one is the definition. What is the focus of the inquiry? What are we wanting to explore together? And that might be a conversation you have with the students or with the stakeholders. That might be something you have a conversation with your department head or your administrator or higher ups in um, central office. But okay, what are we actually going to be looking at? The affirmative topic. So it could be, what's the focus of inquiry? How might we create a school that has a robust diversity, equity, and inclusion program? Or maybe it's um, the question might be about um, how might we create a culture so that every student and the family they go home to feels comfortable interacting with our faculty. Right. So first you have to define the focus. Right. And this actually goes along very nicely with, um, you know, the Pennsylvania scoring rubric for, you know, focus, content, organization, style and conventions. 
um, you know, it's it's about thinking about something and putting in all these different markers along the journey, right? Um, so once you have that focus defined, look at the second one, discovery. What gives life? That's where you're doing the appreciating, just like the, the pair framework. So this gets in a little bit more into the nitty gritty. So it's discovering the best of what was and or is within your classroom, within your organization. So you are in a discovery phase. The question was asked, and now we're going to start to examine things with a, you can see a positive core, a positive question. Once people start to discover that, that's part of, remember we did the appreciative interviews, you're discovering and collecting all this great positive, exciting, and energizing, inspiring data. Once you have that, you have this awareness. All right, now that we have that, you go into the dream phase. That's where you get to play. What might it look like? So given the fact that in the past, like if you want to have uh, student engagement, how might we create something so that all families feel comfortable walking into this building? Well, Let's look back. When was there a time that we had an event, a moment, a high point moment where all stakeholders were engaged? And maybe it was the carnival or maybe it was a talent show or the championship. And how did we get everyone beyond the athletes and the participants to really rally around? Maybe it's the pep rally, right? So you think of those things, gather the data, really analyze the positives. What would it might look like to have something like that as a daily culture? Now, can every day you have a pep rally? Not logistically, but what about the concept of a pep rally? What about a pep rally gets everyone united around a single cause? And what would that look like in the classroom? Or what would that look like throughout the week, the story arc of a week being a student at the school, right? So you start to dream and play and create this imaginative space where you're looking to the future. Once you have clarity on what you want, not just how to remove a problem, but actually what, what you want, not eliminate what you don't, create what you want. Four is the design thinking, which is great because this can align with STEM and how, how many you know, buzzwords do we have around STEM? Let's design it. We're going to reverse engineer. Understanding by design does that, right? Let's look at the outcome. What do we need to do so that it happens? Finally, you have the destiny or the delivery. What will it be? How to empower, learn, and adjust, and you innovate, all right? So you could say that the innovation might be the dreaming or the designing, but the innovating is where like, you actually are making it happen. That's why innovating is one of those words in that positive case study that you're going to be looking at through Aim to Flourish for the next weeks to come is that innovative things aren't just with the idea, it's the implementation. I can have a bunch of ideas, but until you have a minimum viable product, which is an MVP, or you have um, a very scaled down and you prototype it or you beta test it, it's only an idea. You've got to actually put the wheels on the car, put engine, put some fuel in the engine and make it go. That's the true innovation. Um, you know, Leonardo da Vinci had all kinds of blueprints for things. So he had a very imaginative mind. At the same time, how many of those things did he actually put into practice? Right. So that's where the innovation is. All right. Well, a lot going on there. I just broke something down that is extremely complex in just a couple of minutes. But if you can start to think about that, where you're going from, let's create a box, which is the definition. And then you bust out of the box and you have to say, okay, the parameters are within this topic, but now that we've established that and we've understand our strengths around the topic, let's just really, the sky's the limit within the dream. And then you bring it back down. Okay, well, 
what could we actually do ideally? And then the destiny and the delivery happens a little bit later, but this keeps on going and keeps on going. So, you know, when you have action plans and you have phase one, phase two, phase three of the action plans, you're constantly coming back and saying, okay, well, what worked well about phase one? What do we want to keep? What do we want to pivot? What do we want to, you know, start doing, stop doing, try doing, and you keep on revisiting. And that is how you can get this sustainable change because it's constantly building, it's constantly cycling through. This this concept of a circle is very, very important within appreciative inquiry. If you notice all the fractals have this cyclical pattern. Um, again, circles, the seasons, the orbits of the planets, right? There's something very important about the concept of a circle, not organizational development trickle down, but a spider web of circles. All right. so. Now that I've unpacked that for you a little bit, let's see what it might look like within the context of a school. And, you know, I had to take some pre-existing models like a lesson plan, Madeline Hunter and, and all of that work that's been going on for so, so long. And how can we take the 5D and combine it with what we already know? And you're just looking at things and applying it in like a slightly different way, but it's not like we're totally reinventing the wheel. We're just putting a different frame around it. So let's look at a lesson plan. The defined stage would be what standards are we actually going to be addressing in this um, week of learning? Now, when I was working with um, Arizona schools in the uh, Bureau of Indian Ed, we realized for all of the your elementary school teachers, you know, complete transparency about what is the standard? What are all the different verbs of the standard and the, the subjects and the objects of this particular standard? It might take an entire week to unpack one standard if it's a really rich standard. For example, like how does an author use figurative language to establish tone or something like that. Like that's, look at all those words that the students need to define and understand before we can even start to apply it, right? So that's one thing we realized is, you know, sometimes we think in a lesson plan, we throw in as many standards as possible and say, look at what a vibrant, rigorous lesson plan we've got. What we're starting to realize is back off on the standards thrown in there and really do a deep dive and unpack it and also let the students interact, right? So once you have the definition of the standards and the key terms, now you're going to discover the content or the concept. In other words, rather than being the sage on the stage and the teacher of, I've got all this information in my head and I'm just gonna like shove it into your head. Like we, we know, we know that we don't do that anymore, right? Project-based learning and all of that, which is the next column over. But you're discovering the content together with a great question. So for example, um, oh, we'll do Mesopotamia again. So they're going to define like what standard you have for Mesopotamia. Maybe it's about learning how to read a nonfiction text, or if it's something about understanding ancient civilizations and what goes into a thriving uh, community from the past. So you've got your definition. They discover the content and the concept. You are just a way to frame the question, give them the resources available, and they are going to discover it. When it's student-centered, it's so much more powerful. Once they get that content where you are helping to unlock that for them, dream. The students explore how the content is applicable in the future. So great, now that you've known Mesopotamia, and you understand what it was like. How do you imagine some of those things still are in play today? Or what might it look like if the concepts of Mesopotamia were still in force today, right? Like I'm, I'm not an expert on Mesopotamia, but if they start to say like, how does this newfound knowledge unlock future successes for me? Or how can I start to hang this on my previous understanding? Or where would I want to take this in the future? You know, let's dream together. What if the people from Mesopotamia came right here? Let's have an appreciative interview. 
with those people from Mesopotamia? What might that look like? You see, do you see what you can do now? Design is you've got to craft some type of formative or summative assessment where they're going to create, perform, respond, write to something, design something. And then the deploy part is where they can be metacognitive and they unpack it. If they do a slide deck, they present on it. If they write a paper, which can be very cerebral, but also kind of passive, maybe they all take turns um, giving a debrief on what their paper was mainly about and have a little discussion. Um, if they are to create some type of project or poster, they see if it works or whatever like that. So that you can do with a daily lesson plan. You can do that weekly. Now, what happens if you have this more, this thinking, because it's such a high level concept of the 5D cycle, the lesson plan, it's a very finite process. Project-based learning is way more open-ended. So what you can do is, well, let's define the perimeters of the challenge, of the problem, of the conundrum, um, you know, problem we have, or the project is, you know, we have $100,000 to spend in our community. Let's research, like, where do you want to spend that money? Why? And, and persuade us um, why you think that we should have um, an ice skating rink in town or... Um, I don't know, a movie theater right in town, right? You get the idea. So you define the perimeters. Maybe that will be the time that you do the rubric and what better thing to have the students, uh, you can inquire to the students, like what do you think a really good project would look like? What should we have? Have them co-create the rubric. So then you give them the discovery page or discovery phase where they research everything and, and they keep track of all their sources and you turn them loose and you are there to facilitate, to make sure that they'll be successful. The students then apply the data to hypothesize. So it's like, okay, now that you research all the different things you could do with that $100,000 and you think this one is the best, ooh, what might, what might it look like if they actually had that skating rink in town or uh, a public swimming pool or whatever? Then they design it. They design their project and then again, they deploy it. So it's very performative. Students need to interact with one another. It's very social. It's active and not passive. Well, let's take it out of the classroom. What if you have a conversation with um, people at the faculty meeting, at the PLC, at the IEP, right? So first let's define the topic we're going to explore. And if you could do it in a question, that would be great. The discovering would be the different perspective. So the de definition might be, we are here to have a conversation about um, a student's attendance um, challenges com coming to school. So that is the topic. Let's discover the different perspectives. You know, I'm wondering, can you tell me a little bit about um, the challenges to that student getting here on time or getting into the building? Were there times that they were? And let's let's discover some moments where they could come in and what was going on to make that possible? Possible? What's changed? How can we support? Dream. What might that look like coming into the building? Can we? see you know what would that look like and what would the ultimate outcome be if if the student and the family can say oh like this is what it would look like if they were here on time and get them excited about that outcome and have them co-create and be a part of this you know it this is not um reactive that way it's more um opens up a curiosity loop in them like who what, what would that be like you know the more you can ask questions as opposed to telling a family something, the more you tell things, they're going to say, but, 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 but I don't see it that way. But if it's a true generative conversation, question based, strength based, these are the types of experiences you want to create. The design phase of a conversation. All right. So we have this outcome. We have these possibilities. Let's put in together a plan. And then the deploy is before we even leave this conversation, you know, what steps can we commit to take action to? So it might be, all right, so what would it look like? Well, the student would be super organized in the mornings. They're not looking for their bag and, and their lunch because maybe they have executive functioning challenges. So, you know, what might it look like um, 
let's dream what it would look like. Well, I'd wake up in the morning and everything would be in my backpack and I wouldn't be struggling and I wouldn't know what I'm going to be wearing. Right. So all these things, like, let's just take the problem, do the positive opposite. All right. So design it. What would that look like? Well, and let the student realize, I guess I need to pack my backpack the night before, put it at the front door, have my laptop charged. I need to make sure I know what the outfit is that I'm going to wear the night before, not last minute. You get the whole thing. And deploy it. So what can we do right now before we leave the meeting to make sure that you're successful? Let's make a checklist right now on board. Together, let's do it. Going to do it tomorrow? I know you can do it. Let's follow that checklist tomorrow. I know you're going to be here on time. I believe in you. It's totally possible. And let's have a reward system in, in place for, for when we track your success. All right. Last thing I would like you to be thinking about is because we've been talking about dreaming about the future, I want you to do some visualization right now. So I want you to put down your pen or pencil, take your fingers off of the laptop. And I just want you to think about as you come back to your position in the beginning of the new school year, new academic year, whether or not you're a teacher, support staff, therapist, social worker, some people might be doing some leadership, mentorship, working with um, a team. You've got a couple of days to prepare for it. And then the students come back to school. What does that look like when students are coming back? What do you think they're excited about most? How do you see yourself supporting them? And as you're all working together, being curious, using these leadership skills, let's just take a magic wand and whoosh, all of a sudden it's the end of the first marking period. They've all been successful. You feel like this course that you took over the summer did this transformational leadership approach for yourselves. What did they accomplish in that first marking period that you never thought would be possible were it not for using these frameworks? If you need to pause the video, you can journal that. As you think of September, October, November, right around Thanksgiving time, it's parent-teacher conferences. What conversations do you imagine having with those parents? Or grandparents, or cousins, the families? What are you so proud of that you all were able to work together to achieve? What leadership skills were you able to lean into? There were a lot of great leadership style resources that people posted. So, you know, were you transformational for them? Were you a team leader? Were you a visionary? Just really take a moment, you know, how do you feel at the end of the marking period after having used all of your strengths as a leader in this newfound appreciative inquiry knowledge? You might want to pause and journal that. Now here's some more pointed thought joggers. And you may want to pause it again. What is the climate and the culture? Like all of these different burger dots could be like an entirely different multi-page paper, right? So I don't necessarily need you to get so, so deep, but just really think about this because these are going to be 
some of your goals that you're going to focus on in the next couple of weeks. So the climate and the culture, the social emotional needs, how do you see making these shifts and pivots, helping that, supporting that? The engagement and achievement of students, the feeling of inclusion, about that family community relationship, the relationship between the family and the school, the relationships among the adults. And just in general, we're talking about these words like resilience, right? So how do you imagine the decisions that you've made as a leader, being curious, being appreciative and grateful, having these questions that are strength-based. How do you see all of that contributing to a successful first marking period? And again, you may want to pause this. Here's another one. What do you imagine the people are saying about the first marking period? You could put some quotes. You know, and some of those quotes might even be a vision board. Vision board, that's a great one too. All right. Here they are. I think I, I don't know if I had put another one of these similar slides on, but Here's the um, reflect and connect part of the pair framework. In what ways are you most excited to lean into your newly acquired appreciative inquiry and curiosity leadership skills? Which one of these do you really like the most? No right or wrong answer. And as promised, I think I did end a lot earlier. You know, there's there's other things I feel like um, at, in some ways, I feel like I just scratched the surface, but the feedback was, you know, I gave you a lot, a lot to think about. So um, take the time and, and I need to tell myself, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, this is the beginning, not the end. And you know, all these different questions and discussion posts and things that um, I now realize I overwhelmed you um, and I apologize. I just wanted to create opportunities for you to really dig deep. So to that end, um, what I might want to do is, I'm writing it down. I might want to create like a, a little workbook journal or something like that. So that way, or at the very least, like give you a modified slide deck for this, give it to you. So that way, you know, what you don't get a chance to do a deep dive into for these short six weeks, you know, I want this, the course that keeps on giving and you can come back and reflect and go back and, and have all these resources available for you. And now that we have our contact information and everything, um, you know, I would really look forward to hearing back from you saying, oh, you know, I use this thing and here it is in November and wouldn't you know it. And, you know, you journal some of these things. And at the end of this project that we're going to be doing at the end of this course, um, wouldn't that be amazing if you created these smart goals, this SOAR analysis of 5D cycle application, you set your intention by the end of this course, and wouldn't you know it by November, you did it. You did it with, with your students or your faculty, staff, colleagues, right? All right, there you are. Thank you so much. Um, the next rest of the course, it's gonna be more now that I've front loaded all of this stuff, um, now you'll have more time to go back and revisit and use some of these resources for um, a project that you're going to be working on. Um, the next thing we're going to be doing is 
a case study. All right, so you did the appreciative interview, you know how to conduct an appreciative interview, and then you're going to be doing an appreciative interview, not with one of your classmates, but you're gonna be going out into the real world and do an appreciative interview to collect a positive case study, a story of success, and put that together for all of us to read. And we're gonna start to realize, hmm, like there's, there's like a through line running through all of this stuff. All right, well, thank you so much. If you have any questions, you know where to reach me, Jennifer Osger at Jennifer, jenformation.com. Not Jennifer Osger, let me say that again. Jennifer at jenformation.com. I am Jennifer Osger. And um, yeah, that's it. I will be looking forward to reading your, what is it that you did? Your appreciative interviews. And I've got some stuff this week. You're taking a break, but I'm putting all the other stuff for you for the following week so you can get a head start if you know that you're not going to be around next week. You'll, you'll have it there for you. And uh, I look forward to continuing to engage with, with less, right? So we're going to do more with less. Thanks a lot. Bye.